Doreen Virtue, Doreen Virtue was very, very rich. Very rich. Made a lot of money. Writing books, self-help books to help people out of their challenges. And her books were a mixture of many different types of religious teachings, all under the umbrella of the so-called New Age movement. And she was in high, high demand as a speaker, as a writer. And she said she was, had a lot of money. In Hawaii, she had a huge piece of property, beautiful house, in demand as a speaker. And when she would go from one place to another, they would always put her in fine hotels, speaking to large crowds. One day, as she was in her vehicle driving, she liked to listen to different religious teachings. She put on a Christian radio program, and the teacher was talking about some people like religious teachings that scratch and tickle their ears. And she thought, wow, that is me. I'm always looking for teachings that tickle my ears. So when she got home, she told her husband, we need to start going to a real church. And her husband agreed. So they began going to a real Christian church. And then she began to read the scriptures and to try to grow in the Christian faith. And one day, as she was reading through the book of Deuteronomy, she learned about what it is to be a false prophet and the troubles with divination and those types of things. And God hit her hard. And she repented of her sins because even though she had listened to the Christian program on the radio, she was still advising people in the wrong way. And so she repented of her sins, gave her life completely to Jesus. The only problem was her books, which are many, and you can go on Amazon and see all these books by Doreen Virtue, teaching about angels and all these kinds of things from a new age perspective. And she was looking at her life, and she said, for so many years I have borne fruit for death, and now I want to bear fruit for life. So she wrote a book called Deceived No More. Deceive no more. And she tried to tell people, what I wrote before, it is not right. And she has tried to get people not to read what she wrote before. She was, suff she was subject to a lot of ridicule and anger from her great bunch of admirers. But she has stood her ground and her book deceived no more. And she went on to get a master's degree in theology to try to now defend and preach the faith that she one time rejected. But she for a time was bearing fruit for death. Now she bears fruit for life. And this morning we're going to read from the book of Romans, just six verses about the choice that we all have in the same way that Doreen had, to bear fruit for life or to bear fruit for death. And our theme this year, you know, is fruitfulness. And I know that in our church, we want to bear fruit for life. So book of Romans, chapter 7, from 1 to 6, up here on the screen, the Apostle Paul is writing, Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, 
The sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Father, thank you so very much for all you have done for us in Jesus. And we pray in the name of Jesus that you will speak to us this morning so that we can hear your word and live and glorify you in the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. My brothers, you were made to die to the law through the body of Christ that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. That small sentence tells us what we want to learn this morning. Jesus' fruit is always fresh. Jesus' fruit is always fresh. If you go to the market, you always want to make sure, if you're buying some fruit, that it is fresh, that it is not rotten, that when you get it home, it will taste beautiful to you. So when you go to the market, priority number one is fresh fruit. Or anything that you buy, you want it to be fresh. And in Jesus, what Jesus always gives us, Jesus' fruit is always, always fresh. It's never rotten, never spoiled. We serve him in newness of life. Newness of the Spirit. In Jesus, everything is always new. We serve him in newness of the Spirit, bearing fruit for God. Bearing fruit for God, good fruit, because Jesus' fruit is always fresh, with life, with purpose, and with hope. Jesus' fruit is always, always fresh with life with life. We have died to the law through him. We have died to the law through him so that we might bear fruit for God and be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead. We were at once joined to a law. Now we are joined to Jesus, to Jesus or to a law that we might bear fruit for God. The Apostle Paul says that there is a choice that we all have to make. And it says here that we have been, we have died to the law and joined rather to Jesus. But it doesn't just say Jesus. In fact, it says to him who was raised from the dead. We are joined not just to him, but to him who was raised from the dead. So that when we know we are joined to Jesus for fruitfulness, it's not just Jesus, but an emphasis that Jesus was raised from the dead. So in him, he is a source of constant, constant life. Raised from the dead, never to die again. So that we are joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead. We once were joined to a law, to a piece of paper that told us what is right or wrong. But now we have died to the law and are joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead. And when we look to Jesus and are joined to him, we are joined to a never-ending stream of life, to fruit that never grows stale. Jesus' fruit is always fresh because he is alive forevermore. He is the one who has risen from the dead and we are joined to him. There was a young man and he worked in a church and he was behind a curtain and his job was to, to pump air into an organ. And the one playing the organ did beautifully one Sunday. 
played the organ so nice. After the service, the young man who was behind the curtain pumping air into the organ, after the service, the young man said, we did beautifully today, didn't we? And the one who was playing the organ said, we? It is not we, it is I. The next Sunday came and the organist sat down to play and she pressed the keys and nothing came. And the young boy from behind the curtain said, is it we or is it I? And she realized it is we. And in Jesus, if we want to bear fruit, if we want to bear fruit, and I believe we all do, it is only by being united to Jesus that we bear good fruit. We are joined to another to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law, aroused by the law, exacerbated our sin, and we bore fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law and serve in newness of spirit, rather than oldness of letter. Paul says we have died to the law. We are free from the law. But what does that mean? Doesn't that mean that we now believe in anarchy? If we have died to the law, released from the law. Paul here is telling us we have not been released from the ethics of the law, but from the weakness of the law. We have not been released from the law of God, but from the law as God. Everyone apart from Jesus lives under a code of conduct. It might be a very well-structured code of conduct, like the Mosaic law that Paul is referring to here. It might be a well-structured code of conduct. Do this, do this, don't do that. Or it should be something that you just devise in your head. It's your code of conduct. But that code of conduct outside of Jesus becomes your God. It is what you follow. And if you do well, you pat yourself on the back. You say, I did well. And if you fail, you make excuses or you lie and blame somebody else for your failures. But that code of conduct, whether it's a mosaic law or it's something you put together in your head, is your God. It is what you follow. And Paul says we need to die to that. Because in Jesus we find our life. A code of conduct has no power to make us right. So we do not die to the law as his ethics, but to its weaknesses. Any law, any code of conduct tells us we must be righteous, but it has no power to get us there. A law or a code of conduct tells us we need forgiveness, but it cannot forgive us. It tells us we must be righteous, but it cannot make us righteous. It says we need power, but it has no power to make us righteous. Only joined to Jesus can we become righteous, can we be forgiven, and can we have power to do what God asks us to do. The Apostle Paul says we have been joined to another, to him who has been raised from the dead. You once were joined to a law, to a piece of paper, or maybe to a stone that chiseled out by God. You were once joined to that, but it gave you no power. It only condemned you, but it gave you no power. And it only exacerbated the rebellion within you. Do not steal, and you became a thief. A pastor was preaching. His name was Paris, Paris Reedhead. And he was telling a story when he was a young man. His mother was going out, and before she left, she said, Paris, do not take pussy willows, that flower out there. Do not take any of those pussy willows and put them up your nose. Paris said he never, ever, 
ever even thought about taking a pussy willow and putting it up his nose. But as soon as his mother left, he went out, took a pussy willow, and put it up his nose. Because the law, the law that his mother gave, exposed the rebellion and aroused rebellion in his heart. And Apostle Paul says, when you were in the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law worked within you to bear fruit for death. So the law's ethics are good, but its weaknesses are obvious. It cannot make us righteous. It cannot forgive us. It cannot give us any power. So we have a choice to be joined to a list of rules or to be joined to Jesus. Joined to a letter or joined to the living God. Joined to rules or joined to a resurrected Jesus. Jesus' fruit is always fresh. In him who has risen from the dead, we always find good fruit. It's always fresh because he is risen from the dead. When I was a young man, my mother, a same situation as Paris Reedhead, my mother was going out and she said, Jeff, that pharmacy that pharmacy that is somehow close by, do not ride your bicycle there. The traffic is too much. A friend came over, and what did we do? We got on our bicycles and drove a road to that store. It was an amazing, amazing pharmacy because in that pharmacy, there were shelf upon shelf upon shelf of every type of toffee, every candy that I loved to eat. It had everything, everything, shelf upon shelf upon shelf. And I was looking at it with my friend, admiring what am I going to buy? The choices are so many. Then my friend said to me, Jeff, I said, yes, look behind you, he said. I looked behind, and there was my mother. And she said two words, get home. I went home fast. I don't remember what happened in the house, but I know it wasn't pleasant. <laughs> but the law aroused rebellion. My mother said, don't ride your bike there. And what did I do? I took my bike there. The law is weak. But Jesus is strong. And in Jesus, he overcomes every weakness of the law, every written code that we follow. In Jesus, he overcomes it. We need forgiveness, Jesus gives it. We need righteousness, Jesus gives it. We need power, Jesus gives it. In him, in him, we bear fruit for God. Only in him, only in him. And Jesus' fruit is always fresh, joined to a resurrected Jesus. Jesus' fruit is always fresh with life. If we want life, we find it in Jesus, not in a written code. We find ethics there, but they cannot give us power to do what the ethics say. They're weak, but in Jesus, he gives us the power to be righteous, to be, have life. Jesus' fruit is always fresh with life. Jesus' fruit is always fresh with purpose. All of us want a purpose in life. And this section, this brief passage gives us our purpose. We are joined to him, him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. The sinful passions that were aroused by the law that bore fruit for death are no more because in him, in him, we serve in newness of life. We serve God in newness of life. We bear fruit for God. 
are two purposes, really just one. What is our purpose in life? To bear fruit for God. To serve him in newness of life. That is our purpose. We are joined to Jesus to bear fruit for God and to serve him in newness of life. Not wandering aimlessly in life, but to serve him, to be active, doing what he wants us to do in the newness of life that he gives us. That is our purpose, to bear fruit for God. To bear fruit for God, meaning we are to reflect him in the day-by-day -day life that we live. To bear fruit for God, to reflect him in our character, in our thoughts, and in our conduct. That people can see that is what God is like. Jack Texera is very famous right now. Very, very famous. President Putin knows about Jack Texera. Texera. The president of Ukraine knows about Jack Texera. President Biden knows about Jack Texera. Probably President Akufo Addo. Most likely all the world leaders knows about this man. He's very, very famous. Not because he has done anything good, but because he does something very bad. He's a thief. He's a thief. He had a job with a branch of the military in the U.S. And he was on some chat rooms. And somehow he had access to highly classified information. And he began to post it on the internet in the chat rooms that he was connected to. And anything on the internet is soon going to have wide distribution. And so soon the government found out something is on the internet that should not be there. And they tracked him down. And as the walls of the law were coming close to him, Jack Texera said of his prayer to God, I never ever wanted it to get like this. I prayed to God that this would never happen. And I prayed and prayed and prayed. Only God can decide what happens from now on. And he said in another post, what I've done is life in prison type thing. He's a thief. He took what did not belong to him and put it on the internet. Bearing fruit, not good fruit at all. The Apostle Paul tells us that our purpose in life is not to be a thief, not to engage in all sorts of sexual sins, sexual deviancy, not to lie, steal, but our goal, our purpose in life is to bear fruit for God and to serve him in newness of life, in newness of life. The ethics of the law are still there. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not covet. Do not commit adultery. They are still in force. But in Jesus, we can keep those laws and fulfill our purpose to serve God in newness of life. And so the choice is ours. Do I want to live a life? And there are several contrasts in this passage. There are several contrasts. We can bear fruit for God or bear fruit for death. We can be res united to a resurrected Jesus or united to a dead law. We can serve God in newness of life or serve in oldness of letter. The choice is ours. In one, there is a great and grand purpose that we can live lives bearing fruit for God, serving him in newness of life, or bear fruit for death, living by the old, old letter. And the choice is for us. And in Jesus, being united to Jesus, we can fulfill the purpose that God has for us. We all might have a specific purpose. God wants me to do this very thing. But the great umbrella and overarching purpose for all of us is to bear fruit for God 
and serve him in newness of life. So if someone asks you tomorrow, why are you here? What is your purpose? You can say, I am here to bear fruit for God and serve him in newness of life. And the person might ask, how do you do that? And you can say, Jesus' fruit is always fresh. United to him, I can bear fruit for God and serve him in newness of life. Because in Jesus, fruit is always, always fresh. Jesus' fruit is always fresh with life, with purpose, and with hope. This passage seems to really denigrate the law of God. Why did God even give it if it's weak and it arouses sinful passions? if it's something we need to die to, to be done with it. But this passage gives really a different angle on the law of God. It's weak, yes, in that it has no power to empower us. It has no ability to forgive us. It cannot help us become what we should be. But the law of God is actually tells us there is hope. Because God gave the law telling us we need to be like this. We need to do this, this, this. And by giving us that law, God is telling us, I will help you get there. This written code may not have the power, but I will help you get there. So it's a prophecy of hope for us. The law is not defective, just deficient. It's not defective. It has no errors in it, but it is deficient. It cannot get us where we need to go, but by giving us that law, God is saying, this is what I want you to be. This is what I expect you to be, and I will help you get there. So the law of God points us to Jesus. It points us to Jesus, and in him, we become what the law requires. In him. So the law of God is a sign to Jesus. It gives us hope, because when God asks us to do something, he gives us hope that we can. So the law of God, yes, it is weak, but it is also a signpost of hope. A professor wanted to be a good person. He really wanted to be a good person. So he listed 30, 30 virtues. And he said, each day I'm going to work on these virtues so that I can become a very good person. He had 30 of them, and each day of the month he took one of them. And so the first day, he will say it was patience. And he really practiced patience on that first day. And he did well. He was so excited. And the second day came, and we'll say that the second day was anger. He didn't want to be angry at all. So the second day came, and he was so good. He was so happy. And each day was a different virtue. And each day, he did well on that particular virtue. But when he came to the end of the month, he realized that he had done the virtue for that day, but the ones from the beginning of the month he had forgotten, he wasn't practicing them again. Because the law couldn't help him to do what he wanted to do. On his own strength, he couldn't accomplish it. But the law of God tells us that these virtues that God wants us to do, to practice, and to be, God gives us the power. God gives us the power in Jesus Jesus' fruit is always fresh in hope. In hope. So the law of God, yes, it is weak, but it is also a sign of hope. Not in the rules, but in Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. So Jesus' fruit is always fresh. And this year, we want to be fruitful. But there's only one way for us truly, truly, truly to bear fruit for God. And that is by being joined to Jesus. And Paul says it's not just Jesus, but Jesus who has risen from the dead. And in him we have life, un 
unending supply of life from Jesus who rose from the dead. Jesus' fruit is always, always fresh with life, with purpose, and with hope. A woman was married to a very abusive husband. Every day he would leave a list of things that he wanted her to do. And he would deal severely with her if she did not do them when he came home at night. Then the man died. By the grace of God, this woman married another man who was very, very gracious and kind. And one day as she was going around the house, she opened up one of the, dress, the drawers in her chest of drawers. And she found an old list from her first husband. Do this, do this, do this. And she looked at that list, and when she was married to the first husband, that list annoyed her and made her angry. And she couldn't do them. But she looked at that list now with the second husband and said, Wow, everyone on this list, I am doing it. Because I love my husband. And out of that love for him, everything he asks me to do, I do, and it's no problem at all. And that's the way it is with Jesus. In our relationship of love, all that he wants us to do, serving him in newness of life, those commands that he has given us, we are able to do because in him is the strength we need. Jesus' fruit is always, always fresh with life, with purpose, and with hope. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, that in you, in you, you give us life, you give us purpose, and you give us hope. Thank you, God. Glorify your name in our lives so that we may bear fruit for you. Bear fruit for you and serve you daily, daily in newness of life. Never the old way of life, but in newness of life. Strengthen us, Jesus, for your glory. Amen.